On the docket tonight, the tragic story of a poker player, professional poker player who lived in California, came back home to Michigan uh, to spend some time with family, ends up getting sexually assaulted, murdered, and her remains 90% burnt. Let's take a listen to the story of Susie Q. Court records spell out gruesome details to authorize the charge of first-degree murder that Zhao was bound with zip ties, had been sexually assaulted, and attacked with an object. The details too graphic for TV. She was found on July 13th at 8 a.m. in a secluded Pontiac Lake recreation area. She was lit on fire until she died. The man charged is 60-year-old Jeffrey Morris, a convicted sex offender, but with no recent sex crimes. After his arrest, he cooperated operated at first, admitting he picked up Susie on Watkins Lake Road and checked into the Sherwood Motel with Susie at around 9.26 p.m. They drove to a liquor store to purchase alcohol and went back to the motel. Morris told police Susie left the motel at midnight, taking all of her belongings, including her cell phones, with her. But cell phone records show otherwise. Surveillance videos from nearby the motel and cell phone records show that at 5 a.m., Morris left in his car and the cell phones were tracked to the location of the secluded park, including Susie's. Days later, the FBI located Morris and his car in Ypsilanti. They would find a treasure trove of physical evidence in the trunk, footwear impressions, several hairs and fibers with possible blood. They also found inside duffel bags Morris's ID, a bed sheet with apparent blood spots, and a wooden baseball bat with a big blood stain. All are being tested at the Oakland County Crime Lab. There was early speculation this murder might be connected with Susie Q, as she was known on the surface playing as a poker pro, living in Las Vegas and Los Angeles. So you look at this case, and it's, it's a tragic, horrific ending, but how does this young woman end up interacting or, or lives crossing with this convicted sex offender, and what role will that motel play in all of it, and, and how will that all play inside a courtroom? Let's bring in our friend and attorney from Michigan, Jamie White, back with us. Uh, Jamie, great to see you. Um, this is a case that it seems that prosecutors have a lot of forensic evidence. But before we get there, um, when I tried cases, I had to tell the jury a story as a prosecutor. And I always thought that was such an important part of the case. Um, I don't know what this story is that's going to be told in this courtroom, but it looks like Susie may have been mixed up in some stuff that, that wasn't great. I mean, I don't know how she ends up at that motel and interacting with this convicted sex offender. Yeah, Vinny, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I want to come back to your forensic point. I think that's a really important point to hit. I don't agree with you that there's a lot of forensic evidence. I suppose there is, but I don't know that it necessarily um, is dispositive in this case. But to your point about telling the story, I, I hear you, man, I, you know, when you're in a situation like this, you have to concede some points. And I think that the defense in this case would be making a huge mistake if they were not to concede that there was some relationship. It might have been one day, it may have, it may have been uh, completely uh, innocent, but to, to argue that these two didn't know each other in some capacity is a mistake. Um, and to your point, I think to argue that uh, there probably wasn't some level of nefarious um, activity surrounding these two is also a mistake. Um, you know, the story is, you know, at what point in time do we go from these two having whatever relationship they had um, to him committing a murder? And what I would suggest to you, uh, and I'm not here to defend Mr. Morris, um, you know, clearly there is a lot of evidence that points to uh, a huge suspicion around him. However, um, I would I would push back on the idea that forensic evidence is being tied to him. Um, you know, a five hour preliminary examination, you know, we have cell phones put in a relatively uh, same time, same location. And, and to the extent he's not even disputing that. So I think we have to be careful with that, um, especially in light of the fact that we know that Mr. Morris had contact with another couple at 1.30 a.m., you know, his, his position as this young woman left the hotel at 12 a.m., there's witnesses that uh, found the body and, and make some 
some uh, some eyewitness identification between those periods of time and when she was found. But we know that Mr. Morris had contact with at least two other individuals around 1.45, 2 a.m. And Vinny, what's crazily interesting about that and why I would encourage, you know, your audience and the jurors and everybody to be, you know, cautiously optimistic, clear thinking and, pre you know, and exercise pragmatism when it comes to this is what was this other couple engaging Mr. Morris for, for at this hour of the night? I'm not suggesting they were involved in the murder. What I'm suggesting is that if we're going to play this story out and try to explain why this young woman was, was with this man, I think we have to look at why this other young couple was with this man at 1.45, 2 a.m. on the same night at the homicide. They claim they were getting a ride. That's all messy in the prelim. But uh, And then they also go on to say they went to the ATM to get you know, to get money for purposes that were not explained under oath. Um, so there's a lot of questions in this case, you know, more questions than answers. And clearly, uh, Mr. Morris has, has got some issues. But I think that we would be selling ourselves short if we don't take a more careful look at this. Yeah, well, that's that's why I started with the story. I said th th there's mm -hmm. going to be a story here. And, and I don't know if it's a pretty story. And I don't know if it's a clear story. And I don't think right. we're dealing with the pillars of society, right? So right. Um, these... The story has to be told through witnesses, and if they get up on the stand and, you know, they're trying to hide something, then jurors may just discount everything they're saying. So there are seriously issues here. Now, what do you think the defense is going to do here? Are they going to point the finger at someone else, or are they just going to say, listen, there's not enough pointing at this defendant? Do you think that's the way they're going to go? You know, it's a little unclear at this point in time. I'm going to read you. So uh, the defense attorney in this matter uh, filed a couple of motions on October the 14th. She asked for um, money for a private detective and money for an expert. Um, and she specifically said in her motion for the expert, and I'm just going to read what she said in her pleading, because the prosecution has chosen to endorse and call witnesses on the issues of defendant's whereabouts as connected to the deceased, he is entitled to rebut that same evidence. So it appears that she's focused on this idea that there's people that are saying he was at a particular time and, uh, and that's not the case, or at least there's reasonable doubt to that. I would suggest to her, and I'm not trying to run her case for her, but I would suggest that she focus on the cell phone uh, analysis that have been presented. You know, we all know that you know cell phone data is very important in forensics these days, but it's not dispositive, especially in a city of this magnitude. You know, cell phones bounce around all day long. Uh, we haven't heard any forensic evidence, Vinny. Uh, we we know there was blood in the room. We know there was um, uh, cell phone data, and we didn't hear anything in the prelim to suggest that the DNA or blood associated with the bat or anything in the vehicle was directly attached to this gentleman. And, and I hope that she will also reach out and address some of those issues. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. all cases are tough, but this one may have yeah. some problems. Jamie White, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the program tonight. We'll see you again really you, soon. Vinny. All Thank right, you. folks, we'll be right back. We've got uh, some dramatic video involving a police shootout with a couple of murder suspects. That's next.